One thing gardeners find very difficult to do is to select the right kind of fertilizer. Part of this is due to a lack of understanding of how fertilizer works, but a big part is due to the fact that fertilizer manufacturers tell you all kinds of things to try and sell their products. In this session, I'm going to try to help you pick the right fertilizer. Now, I'm not going to pick specific products, but after today, you'll find it much easier to go out and buy fertilizer. We're going to have a look at the difference between organic and synthetic and help you decide which one is right for you. We're also going to look at slow and fast release. This is critical when you're selecting a fertilizer. We'll also look at the right NPK ratio. Your choice between organic and synthetic fertilizer comes down to three important points. The first one is a life choice. Some people decide that they're going to go organic for the benefit of their family, the environment, and the world. And there's nothing wrong with that choice. You can also select between organic and synthetic based on the fact that one is slow release and the other is fast release. Organic is a slow feed for your plants and synthetic is a fast feed for your plants. But it's a little more complicated than that and we're going to have a closer look at that. The third important difference between organic and synthetic is the amount of organic matter that they provide. Now, generally, synthetic fertilizers don't provide any organic matter to the soil, which means they don't help in long-term soil building. But some organic fertilizers also don't add organic matter, and I want to have a closer look at that. Let's talk about slow and fast feed. On this slide, I'm showing potassium nitrate which is one of the main components of a lot of synthetic fertilizer. Its chemical formula is KNO3. When it meets water, it separates into two separate molecules. One molecule is potassium, and the other one is a nitrate. Now this happens with almost all synthetic fertilizer. They very quickly turn into the nutrients that are available for plants. So both that potassium and that nitrate are now in the soil in the water and they can move around in the soil. As soon as they migrate down to where their roots are, plants can use them. This is what we call a fast feed. Now a fast feed is really great when plants are desperate for some food. So if a plant is showing a nitrogen deficiency, you want to get that nitrate down to the roots as quickly as possible. And for that, synthetic fertilizer is great. The downside of a fast feed is that these nutrients don't hang around for very long. They either get absorbed into your soil or they move down the soil profile every time it rains. Potassium moves fairly quickly. So at the end of the summer, all that potassium you put on in the spring has been washed down to an area below the root level and doesn't do any good for your plants. To understand this better, let's have a look at organic fertilizer and see what happens to it over time. One of the best organic fertilizers is compost. So what happens to compost? Well, when you start, you can see all the particles in there. You can see the banana peel. You can see the rotten orange and the eggshells and whatever else you've thrown in there. So what you do is you let it sit for six months. You turn it once in a while. You add some water and you end up with this nice black stuff that we call finished compost. But it's not finished yet. It only looks finished to our macro eyes. If we look at this more on a molecular basis, we see something completely different. This slide represents a large protein molecule. And these molecules can have thousands of atoms in them. They're really large. When you take some finished compost, that protein is still intact. It looks exactly the same after six months as it did inside the banana peel. It hasn't started to decompose yet. And inside this protein, we have nitrogen, and we have phosphate, and we have copper, and we have sulfur, and we have all the nutrients that plants need, but they're all tied up in this big molecule, and plants can't use it. Here we have a picture of DNA. It's lots of DNA in compost. DNA is a great source of phosphate, but again, that phosphate is tied up in this very, very large molecule, and plants can't use it. This is our finished compost, and we think it's finished, but in fact it isn't. It will continue decomposing for around five years. 
And during that period of time, the large molecules will slowly start to decompose and get smaller and smaller. And as that happens, they release the nutrients a little bit of time over a five-year period. The left side of this slide shows a nitrate molecule from organic fertilizer. On the right side, we have a nitrate molecule from inorganic fertilizer. Can you spot the difference? Well, there isn't any. They're identical. When organic material decomposes, it will eventually release the nitrogen as a nitrate molecule. And that nitrate molecule from compost looks exactly the same as the nitrate molecule from synthetic fertilizer. Neither a lab, nor plants, nor microbes can tell the difference. They don't know where these came from. And plants and microbes don't care. These are food. These are nutrients for living. Synthetic and organic fertilizers produce the exact same nutrients, but there are some very significant differences between those two, and I'd like to explore that now. Synthetic fertilizer is a fast feed. As soon as water hits that fertilizer, those nutrients break apart and are available for plants, and they move through the soil profile quite quickly. Organic fertilizer, on the other hand, is a slow feed. Remember, it takes five years for all those nutrients to come out. And this is a very significant difference. Fast feed versus slow feed. This shows the composition of ideal soil. And you might notice that there's a very small sliver there, which is the organic matter. Ideally, that's 5%. And in many of our soils, it's much less than 5%. But that small amount is critical to the way soil behaves and is critical for plant growth. Synthetic fertilizer will give you zero organic matter. Organic fertilizer adds organic matter to the soil. And this is one of the biggest differences between synthetic and organic. They both feed plants, but synthetic is a fast feed that does nothing for long-term soil health. Organic fertilizer is a slow feed, but it also adds organic matter, which over time builds aggregation and a better soil. I like to break organic fertilizer down into two main groups. The first group is one that I call solid organic fertilizer. This includes things like compost, manure, vermicompost, plant meals like alfalfa meal, kitchen scraps, and leaf mold. You probably recognize most of these. Vermicompost might be new to you. This is simply the poop from worms. All of these materials are organic fertilizers, but they also have a lot of bulk. They're solid. They have weight to them. And that bulk is important. That bulk is the organic matter that's going to be added to your soil. So all of these are great for building soil long term. There's a second group of organic fertilizers which I will call liquid. These include things like kelp and seaweed extracts, fish emulsion, compost tea. I've also added blood meal to this list, but it's really not a liquid, but in some ways it acts more like a liquid organic fertilizer than a solid. Liquid organic fertilizers are characterized by the fact that when you buy these materials, you're basically buying water with a very small amount of organic fertilizer in them. And many of these are highly processed. So if we look at something like fish emulsion, they take the fish and digest it with a variety of different chemicals. So they're basically composting that fish and turning it into a liquid form. When you get that fertilizer, you're getting mostly water. There are some nutrients in there, so this type of fertilizer does feed plants, but the organic matter, that bulky material, is missing from these. The other thing that happens with these kinds of extracts is that they decompose quite quickly once they're put into soil. The liquid organic fertilizers are a faster feed. Now, they are slower than synthetic, but not nearly as slow as things like compost. And the reason for this is the fact that they're highly processed before you get them. I also put blood meal on this list. It is a solid, but it decomposes in soil very quickly. It provides a lot of nitrogen, but that nitrogen is used up in about a month, maybe two months. So it's not a long-term feed, and it provides very little organic matter to the soil. 
So although these items are organic fertilizers, they're really not providing the same benefits as the solid organic fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizer also comes in a variety of different forms. Many of them are solid material. So these are little pellets that you buy and distribute. They dissolve in water and go into the soil. But you can also get synthetic fertilizer in liquid form. But these are usually used only for house plants. There's also a form of synthetic that is slow release. This fertilizer is specifically formulated to release a small amount of nutrients every time they get wet. And some of these will last up to six months. So you do get a much slower feed from some of these synthetic fertilizers. You can buy these with mostly MPK in them, or you can buy versions of these that have lots of the micronutrients in there. Now we haven't really talked about micronutrients very much, but they are important to plants, but most soil has lots of micronutrients. Now there are other fertilizer-like products, things like bone meal, humic acid, bloom booster, compost tea, and rock dust. Bone meal is basically phosphate with some calcium in them, and most soil has enough of both of those. Humic acid is nothing more than ground up coal. Now, bloom boosters are very popular. They generally have a very high amount of phosphate, but that phosphate doesn't increase the amount of blooms you get in the garden unless your soil is really deficient of phosphate, and that's rarely the case. Compost tea and rock dust does not have a lot of scientific support for use in the garden. Personally, I wouldn't use any of these products in your garden. There are also lots of home remedies, and people make all kinds of claims about things like banana peels, coffee grounds, eggshells, molasses, and milk. Now let me take eggshells for a second. If you put the eggshells in your compost, simply turning the compost tends to break them into small pieces so you don't see them. But chemically, they're not dissolving. They're not adding calcium to the soil. In fact, eggshells don't really do anything in the soil. And by the way, they don't even stop slugs. The other items on this list are just organic matter. They're all about the same. They have no magical properties, even though all kinds of websites and YouTube videos claim that they do. It's just organic matter. And any one of these added to soil has some benefits because there's nutrients in them and they add organic matter to the soil. But there's nothing magical about these products. So how do you pick the right MPK? Well, the first thing you have to understand is that there is no such thing as plant-specific fertilizer. When you fertilize, what you want to do is replace the nutrients that are missing in your soil. Once your soil has all of the nutrients, all of the plants will grow in it. So when you're fertilizing, it's not about the MPK for the plant. It's the MPK that's missing in your soil. Well, how do you know what's missing from your soil? The only way you can know that is to get it tested. The lab that tests your soil will also tell you which nutrients you need to add, and then that is the right MPK. Now, I know most of you are not going to get your soil tested, and I don't even recommend getting soil tested. I take a different approach to things. I just grow a lot of plants. And if they grow, I don't have a nutrient deficiency, and I don't need to add fertilizer. When we look at plants, they use the MPK in the ratio of 3, 1, 2. So that's a good ratio for any fertilizer that you might want to add to the garden. And you can use a 3, 1, 2, or a 6, 2, 4, or a 9, 3, 6. They're all the same ratio. Nitrogen is the one nutrient that is most likely in short supply in the garden, and adding some extra nitrogen to the garden is usually a good idea, but you can't go overboard on this. If you add too much nitrogen, it just runs away and pollutes the rivers and lakes and causes algae blooms. So you only want to put on a little bit, and it's better to put on a little bit more often. So say once a month, you add a little bit of nitrogen to your soil. Let's look at some specific situations. How about your vegetable garden? Well, here's what I recommend. Add compost to the vegetable garden for a long-term feeding and for increasing organic matter. Over time, your soil will get better and better. But the compost you add today in a new garden isn't going to do very much. This is a long-term feed. For this year's vegetables, you want to use some synthetic fertilizer. 
you need to feed them now. Now, once you've been doing this for two or three years, you'll have built up the amount of compost in that soil and you can stop adding the synthetic fertilizer. Raised beds are really no different than a vegetable garden. Add compost for long-term feeding and making your soil better, but add some synthetic fertilizer for today. Containers are a little different. Most people use a soilless mix in containers. They water a lot because that material dries very quickly. Because you're watering all the time, you have to fertilize on a regular basis. And you really want to use synthetic fertilizer here. Organic fertilizer just doesn't cut it because you don't want a long-term feed. You want to grow these plants right now and next year you're going to start all over again. It's also important to include the micronutrients because things like core and peat moss have no micronutrients. So you have to supply those. Now here's a little trick. At the end of the season, don't throw that soil away. That soil, or soilless mix, whatever you decide to use, that you have in containers can be used year after year. Soil doesn't go bad. Now it may shrink a little bit, and some of that organic matter may decompose, so just top it up with some new material, and you're good to go. What about landscape beds? These are things like perennials and trees and shrubs. The good news is that you don't have to feed these plants. You don't really want them growing super fast anyways in most cases. If they're growing and flowering, don't add any more fertilizer. If they're not doing well, get your soil tested and find out what they're missing. Otherwise, you're just guessing at what fertilizer to add. Now, I fertilize my vegetable garden and I fertilize my containers. But as far as my landscape beds go, I add no fertilizer. I grow 3,000 different types of plants and none of them get fertilized. I do mulch with wood chips, and that's it. If you want to add some compost to your beds, that's also a good idea. But I don't even bother doing that. You now know how to match the fertilizer to the application. Do you need synthetic fertilizer, or should you be using a compost? You also know how to pick the right MPK. But there's one big question remaining. Which brand is best? There are so many to choose from. Well, I have some pretty good news for you. All the brands are pretty much the same. They all have the same type of ingredients. When I go to buy fertilizer, I look for a couple things. I look at the MPK, and I want to get the right ratio, but I want those numbers to be as high as possible. The higher the MPK is, the less you pay for the nutrients in the fertilizer. If I'm looking for fertilizer for containers and house plants, I like to see that the fertilizer is marked as water-soluble, and I want to know that it contains the micronutrients. Those two factors are much less important out in the garden. There is one difference between fertilizers which we haven't discussed, and that's the type of nitrogen they add. They can add that nitrogen in the form of nitrates, ammonia, or urea, and the form of that does affect the pH a little bit, but we'll leave that discussion for another video. For the most part, you can ignore that. If you've decided you want to use compost, the next question you want to ask yourself is, which compost is best? And I've put together a complete video that will help you understand compost and help you select the best one. And I'll put a link to that video in the top right hand corner. In the bottom corner, I'll put a link to a playlist that contains all of the videos that deal with soil. Have fun in the garden.